My name is Rick Renner, and today I'm sitting on the ruins of the great temple of Artemis in the ancient, legendary city of Sardis, which at one time was the capital of the Lydian kingdom. And there was a king who lived here whose name was King Croesus. During his life, he was the richest man in the world, and as a result, Sardis was fabulously wealthy. Where did they get all their money? Well, right alongside of Sardis, there's a river called the Pactolus. And if you follow the Pactolus east, it leads to the heart of the Phrygian kingdom where there was another king that was legendary. His name was Midas. Maybe you've heard of King Midas. He was a real king, but there was a lot of legends connected to him. And one legend is that Midas asked the gods to make him rich. And as a result, everything he touched turned to gold. This is where we get the phrase about the Midas touch. A person today who has the Midas touch, everything he touches is blessed. It turns to gold. Well, legend said, everything Midas touched turned to gold. He touched his food. He couldn't eat it because it turned to gold. He touched his drinking utensils. They turned to gold. He even touched his daughter and she turned to gold. And he realized this blessing was really a curse. And he said to the gods, how can I get rid of this Midas touch? And the God said, go into the waters of the Pactolus and wash off the blessing. So he went into the waters of the Pactolus and he washed off the blessing. And the legend says the gold began to flow downstream and stopped here outside Sardis. Now, what's really interesting is that Sardis really is a location where there's a lot of gold. And during the time of the Lydian kingdom, they would extract the gold from the water. And of course, according to the legend, it was a result of the Midas touch, which happened up in the Phrygian kingdom. And as a result of all the gold, this city became fabulously wealthy. And they built a fortress on the top of the hill right behind me, which was called the most secure, strongest fortress on the planet. And that is where King Croesus lived until the kingdom fell to the Persians. That's just a little bit of the history of Sardis. But there was a church here, and it was a great church. It was a church that had a good reputation. But Christ addressed that church, beginning in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, and identified some serious problems and things they needed to correct. And that is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust. A message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Thank you for joining me for today's program. I'm so excited that today you and I can sit down together, open our Bibles, and dive in. Oh, how we love the Word of God. There's nothing to compare to the Bible. And today we're going to be seeing what Jesus had to say to the church of Sardis in Revelation chapter 3. Hold on to your seat because this is going to be packed full for this entire series. Get your Bible, get a piece of paper, get something to write with, and get ready to dive into the scriptures with me to see what Jesus had to say to the church of Sardis because what he had to say to them is what he is saying to many of us. We need to hear these words of Jesus. But as we get started, I want to tell you that if you need prayer, we are here for you. Just contact us at the number on the screen, or send us an email or a letter, we will gladly pray with you. We count it a privilege to put our faith together with you. Jesus said, where two or three of you are gathered together in my name, I'm in the midst. And Jesus really works when we come together in unity and agree in prayer. So if you need somebody to pray with you, call us. We'll put our faith together with you, and Jesus will go to work on your behalf. We really believe that. And I want to say thank you for your partnership with our ministry. You're really helping us take this teaching of the Bible to the ends of the earth, not just there where you live, but this teaching is literally covering the planet. People are hungry for the Bible, and we have a responsibility to bring the Bible to them. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 21 says, the lips of the righteous feed many. My prayer is that God will use my lips and your partnership with me to help me do it to feed many who are spiritually hungry. And I really want to thank you for your partnership. 
Right now we're offering you my brand new series for the first time, which is called Christ's Message to Sardis. It's 10 parts and it comes in multiple formats with a study guide that is loaded with insight and revelation. The back of the series says, if Jesus gave you a report card on your spiritual status, what kind of grade do you think you'd get? That is exactly what he did with the church of Sardis. What is most important in life is what Jesus thinks of us, not what we think of ourselves. Wow, that's powerful. And when we see what Christ had to say to the church of Sardis, it really helps us to reassess our own spiritual status to see what we need to correct so that we get a good report card from Jesus. If you really want to be pleasing to the Lord, this is a series that you need to listen to or a gift to somebody else who also is wanting to really please God. It's just packed full of insight and divine revelation. And we're offering you today a CD. I've never offered you just a CD by itself. Actually, it's a two-part CD series called A Prophetic Alert. My friends, we are living in the end times. The inside of this says, Rick Brenner opens the scriptures and expounds on current events with profound insight. He prophetically forecasts what we can expect in the near future. The signs of the time are clearly spelled out in God's word, but it takes an eye of revelation to see it. As you listen to these messages, you'll understand why this is called a prophetic alert for our time. This is so powerful. In fact, it's one of my favorite series. It's small, just two CDs, but it is really something else. You'll be glad that you ordered this. By the way, it comes in multiple formats. Just go to our website or call us and you can place your order right now. But today we're going to see Christ's message to Sardis beginning in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. But we have to go back to Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 to see how John received the book of Revelation. I understand that I've covered this previously in these series, but we need to always keep in mind how the book of Revelation was received. And when you come to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10, John is writing, and he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I'm Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Well, when you come to verse 10, John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Those words, I was, is a translation of the Greek word genomai. And this word genomai always carries an element of surprise. It's something that takes you off guard, something that takes you by surprise, something that is unanticipated. You could actually translate it like this, in some way that I do not understand. I don't know how it happened. I could never replicate it. It completely took me off guard and by surprise, but in some way, somehow, I came to find myself in the Spirit on the Lord's day. The word spirit in Greek is not uppercase, it's lowercase, it's the word spirit, it's describing the spirit realm. So in one moment, John was in his cave on the Isle of Patmos. Today, if you visit the Isle of Patmos, you can still visit that cave. It is called the Cave of the Revelation. I've been there many times. John lived in that cave with his assistant who had traveled to Patmos with him. He was there as a political prisoner because he refused to burn incense to the image of Domitian. And because of that, he became a political prisoner. And in his very elderly years, he was sent to the Isle of Patmos, an island that had been stripped of all vegetation. And when John and his assistant arrived on Patmos, they began to look for a place to live. And they found a cave on the top of the hill, right in the middle of Patmos. And that cave is where John took up residency for about 18 months. And while he was in that cave, he had a genomai experience. That's what he now describes in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. In one moment he was in the cave and he says, Suddenly, genomai, I was in some way that I do not understand, something I could never replicate. I don't even understand how it happened. But in some way, somehow, genomai, I came to find myself in the spirit, or the Greek really means in another dimension. So John passed from the natural realm across that line that separates these two realms and he stepped over into the realm of the spirit. I came to find myself in spirit or in a spiritual dimension, he says, on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Trumpets in scripture usually 
depict a prophetic voice. So now Jesus is going to begin speaking prophetically to John. Like the voice of a trumpet, Christ is about to declare a message to the apostle John in that cave. But now John no longer sees the cave because he has stepped across that line that separates the natural realm from the spirit realm. And now John says, somehow I came to find myself in another dimension. And when I stepped across that line into the other dimension, suddenly I begin to hear and see things. And I heard a voice as of a trumpet saying, verse 11, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. And then Jesus begins to enumerate the seven churches that he's going to address. He says, first of all, unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamum and unto Thyatira and unto Sardis and unto Philadelphia and unto Laodicea. But notice the order. First of all, Jesus addressed the church in Ephesus. Well, Ephesus was the biggest city in the whole of Asia and it had the biggest church in the entire region. It was an enormous church. A lot of spiritual activity was in Ephesus. And it seems that the Apostle John himself had probably been the angel of the church in Ephesus. By this time, Timothy had already been killed. John was alive. He was the bishop of the whole of Asia. And it seems that John at this time was even the pastor of the church. So Jesus spoke first to the church in Ephesus. Then he spoke to the church in Smyrna. Then he spoke to the church in Pergamum. Then Thyatira. Then Sardis. Then Laod. Uh, Philadelphia, then Laodicea. Why in this explicit order? Well, there was a road. It was a circular road. Some historians call it the postal road because the mail traveled on that road. But it was a circular road that went throughout the province of Asia. And the road began in Ephesus. And if you followed the road, the road naturally led you next to the city of Smyrna. If you got on that road and just kept following the road, next it would take you to Pergamum. And if you kept following that road, next it would take you to Thyatira, which was an outpost constructed to defend Pergamum. But if you kept following the road, next it would take you to the city of Sardis, which is our subject beginning today. Sardis. Now, we don't know who were the first gospel preachers who brought the gospel to Sardis, but whoever they were, they were very brave because Sardis was a very degenerate, very dark place spiritually. It could have been gospel preachers who came from Ephesus. It seems that Ephesus was the missionary base that dispatched preachers all over Asia. Or it could have been gospel preachers who came from Laodicea. Or maybe they came from Philadelphia. Or maybe they came from Pergamum. They came from one of the other churches in the region. But when they descended on the city of Sardis, Sardis was a very dark spiritual place. And they came there in the power of the Holy Spirit, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, they established the church in the city of Sardis. And my friends, I want to tell you, if God can establish a church in Sardis, if God can work in Sardis, then God can work anywhere. You may think that you're living in a very dark place or in a very dark situation. God can work there. If God could establish churches in these seven cities and work mightily in these places, which were spiritually pagan, very, very, very dark and deviant. And yet God's grace was poured out in these places. It means that God can work where you are. He can work in your city. God can work in your family. God will burst on the scene in the lives of those you know that seem that they're living in darkness. In fact, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. God loved to show up in dark places. Now, all of that is the foundation, which leads us to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. So now let's go there. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. Well, in our teaching series, we've already been to Ephesus. We've seen what Christ had to say to Ephesus. After that, we went to Smyrna, and we saw what Jesus had to say to the angel and to the church of Smyrna. Then we went to Pergamum. We saw what Jesus had to say to the angel and to the church of Pergamum. Then we went to Thyatira and we saw that very difficult message that Christ spoke to the angel and to the church of Thyatira. And today we come to the legendary city of Sardis. And in this legendary city, there was the church. But let's begin today in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis, there we have it, in Sardis, write, These things saith he 
that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, and that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. The Greek actually says, but in reality, you are dead. Verse 2, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Verse 3, remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Verse 4, Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Verse 5. He that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will blot, not blot out his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Verse 6. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Notice it says churches. It is plural which means what Jesus has to say to this church, he's saying to every church of that period and to every church for all generations. So don't just think this was a message for a people in the past, a city in the past. This is for anyone who has an ear to hear anywhere in the church for all generations. There is a message here for my ears and for your ears and for your church. Well, what is the message? Well, let's look. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, let's go back to the beginning. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest, but you are dead. Let's begin at the beginning. It says to the angel of the church in Sardis. Every time Jesus addresses these churches in the book of Revelation, he actually begins by addressing the angel of the church. And as we've seen before, this word angel is the Greek word angelos. And the word angelos does not describe in this case a heavenly angel, but rather a human messenger. The Greek word angelos describes a human messenger. It can depict an angel, but in this case, it depicts one sent on a special mission, one dispatched to perform a specific assignment, a delegate or a dignitary. It pictures the role of a pastor. So when Jesus has something to say to the church, he doesn't say it to the church first. First, he says it to the pastor. This is established when he speaks to Ephesus, when he speaks to Smyrna, when he speaks to Pergamum, when he speaks to Thyatira. Now we come to Sardis. In all of these cases, Jesus speaks to the pastor first, which means if Christ has a commendation, the pastor is going to hear it first. If Christ has a correction, the pastor's going to hear it first. If Christ has a rebuke, the pastor's going to hear it first. This is so very important. God is not going to speak to the intercessory prayer people first. He's not going to speak to people in the worship team first. If God has something to say that is directional or correctional, he's going to let the pastor's ears hear it first. And the pastor's job is to be God's representative in the church. He is to hear what God has to say, and then he is to pass it on to the congregation in the power of the Holy Spirit. And I've told you when we discussed Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, that Jesus always calls the pastor an angel. Your pastor is an angel. You need to say to him, Pastor, you're a real angel. That is biblical terminology. He has been dispatched by God to be a guiding light to your congregation. And the Bible says to the angel of the church. Eventually the message is for the church, but first the pastor is going to hear what Christ has to say. The word church is the Greek word ekklesia, and as we've seen before, it is a compound of the word ek and the word kaleo. The word ek means out, the word kaleo means I call. When you compound the two words together, it forms this Greek word ekklesia, which means called out ones. This was not originally a New Testament word. This was a political word borrowed from the city of Athens. In the city of Athens, there was a group of citizens that were gathered together. Those citizens made laws. They decided jurisdiction. They decided who would be the governors, who would be the judges. They decided who would be expelled from the city. They were very powerful people, and this assembly was called the ecclesia. They were the called out ones who ruled in the matters of the region. That is the word which the Holy Spirit used to describe the church, which means the church, your church, my church, any church. We are not called just to be a 
group of people who huddle together in a building down on the corner or just to affect what's going on within the walls of our church, but we are God's ecclesia. We are privileged people called by God, called to a general assembly, and in the spirit realm, we have the power to make decisions that will affect the atmospheres of our cities and our nations. We are the church. Wow, that is so powerful. But this was the church in Sardis. Well, what do we know about Sardis? Sardis was the capital of the ancient Lydian kingdom. Even today, if you visit the ruins of Sardis, you see it was quite a magnificent place. The Greek historian and the father of history, whose name was Herodotus, wrote that the city of Sardis was founded by the sons of Hercules, and it was the most fabulous of all cities during its time. Its most famous king was King Croesus. King Croesus is legendary. He is not a mythical figure. He was a real king in the city of Sardis. Legend says that King Croesus was the wealthiest man on the planet during his time. In fact, he was so wealthy that there is an expression to describe people that are rich. You can call them rich as Croesus. That originated in Sardis with this real king, King Croesus. And his wealth, they said, came from the Pactolus River, which flowed right along the city of Sardis. Well, if you follow the Pactolus all the way east, it leads you into the Phrygian kingdom, where there was another legendary king, not a mythical king, a real king, whose name was Midas. Maybe you've heard of King Midas. He was a real king, but there's a legend about him. And the legend says that Midas really wanted to be rich. So he asked the gods to bless him with a magic touch, and they did it. And as a result, everything that he touched turned to gold, and it's called the Midas touch. Well, at first he was excited, but when he touched his apples and his fruit, they turned to gold. When he touched his eating utensils, they turned to gold. When he touched his daughter, she turned to gold. This blessing turned out to be a curse. He said to the gods, please take this away from me. And the gods said, go into the rivers of the Pactolus and wash, and you will wash off this magic spell, this gold blessing. And legend says that Midas went into the waters of the Pactolus, he washed, and he washed away this magic spell, this blessing of gold, and the gold began to flow downstream from where he lived, flowing in the rivers of the Pactolus, and the gold flowed and flowed and flowed until the gold stopped into the soil around the city of Sardis, and that's where King Croesus lives. Now, what's interesting is that today there is still a lot of gold in that area. And in fact, there was so much gold there during the time of King Croesus that he minted gold coins, and it was the first time in history that gold coins had ever been minted. So the city of Sardis was fabulously wealthy, fabulously wealthy. But by the time that we get to the New Testament, this fabulously wealthy city has become degenerate. It is in a state of dilapidation. And morally, it is filled with filth, just filth. And there's a church in the middle of this environment. And now Jesus is going to address the church in Sardis. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. How's your spiritual life? Seriously, if Jesus gave you a report card, what would be your grade? In the book of Revelation, the church of Sardis didn't get the grade they were expecting, and Jesus warned that they were on the verge of flunking if they didn't change. In Rick Renner's 10-part series, Christ's Message to Sardis, you'll discover how this first century message to the church in Sardis is applicable to our life today. As Rick explores the message to the church in Revelation, you'll discover the foundational cracks the church had allowed to develop and Christ's rebuke and instruction about how to repair them. Available in physical or digital format starting at just $20. When you call or go online today, you'll also receive the two-part CD series, A Prophetic Alert, for just $12. In this special CD teaching series, Rick reveals how current events and Bible prophecy go hand in hand. You'll see that what is in our headlines are prophetic events clearly outlined in Scripture, Christ's message to Sardis, and or the two-part CD series, A Prophetic Alert. Call now, 1-800-742-5593 or go to renner.org. My name is Joel Renner coming to you from Moscow, Russia. And I wanna say thank you to all of our ministry partners. Your support is helping us train people for the ministry. Getting an education is so vital. A good education can help people throughout their lives. 
Think about your own education and how it has helped you in your life. Well, Bible school training is no exception. This kind of an education is a vital tool for those called to serve God in various aspects of ministry. Because of the support of our generous partners, we are able to train and graduate so many students from our Bible Training Center in Moscow. This advanced training has been made possible by the support of our partners. Not only do they graduate, but they go off to make an impact for the gospel. These graduates have started churches, become missionaries, and are teaching, evangelizing, and working in the health ministry in many countries around the world, all because of your support. But there is so much more to do. In the coming years, our training center outreach will produce even greater results with a far-reaching impact, and we need your help. Will you consider joining us as a partner so that we can continue training men and women in our Bible Training Center? The vision you are supporting is the spreading of the gospel around the world. Right from your home right now, you can help us help others by becoming partners in the work and supporting our work financially. Please call 1-800-742-5593 or go online to renter.org. Because of your gift of any size, we can continue to make a huge difference in people's lives. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, the Apostle Paul writes these amazing words. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. When Paul says where sin abounds, that word abounds describes a river that is overflowing and flooding the whole area. It's the equivalent to saying when it looks like there's a flood of sin, grace much more abounds, which means God loves to show up in difficult situations. God loves to show up where there's sin. He loves to show up in darkness. God just delights in pouring his power out in an environment where the devil has been working. That's what we're seeing in the case of Sardis. It was a city that was degenerate. It was filled with moral filth and God's power showed up there and it abounded there and a church was established. That tells me that even if you're living in hard times, even if you're living in a very dark situation or you know someone who's living in spiritual darkness, that's the kind of place where God wants to show up. And if you need somebody to pray with you for God's power to show up in those places, contact us. We will pray for you to move in that place, to move in that person's life. Amen. By the way, I'm offering you my series, brand new, called Christ's Message to Sardis. This is a powerful series. I want you to order yours. We're also offering you right now a CD called A Prophetic Alert. Wow. Two-part series that is loaded with insight about the times that you and I are living in. But let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for this time of the Word of God. Lord, there truly is nothing to be compared to the Bible. Thank you for the words of Jesus to us in Scripture. And Lord, we pray that your grace will be poured out magnificently in our lives. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there is power. I'll see you in the next program.